Well, welcome to Calvary Baptist Church Bible Institute, and I'm glad you can join us today. And we are continuing in um, Bible Doctrine 2, Bible Doctrine 2. And today we are looking at the next Bible Doctrine, and we begin as we study biblical doctrine, we began with bibliology and then theology, Christology, pneumatology, and, and, and it builds up kind of like in a pyramid, the Bible being the foundation of the base, and it builds up into a pyramid. And today we're looking at this very um, important subject or this important Bible doctrine, and that is hemartiology. It's pronounced hemartiology. And hemartiology is the doctrine of sin. And one way to remember this word is when you consider sin, obviously sin is bad. Sin is bad. And just look at that word hemartiology. And it's almost like the word harm, harm kind of stands out. It's hemart, but <clears throat> almost like something, you know, harm. This is something harmful. And I think that's a kind of a, a key way to, to remember what hemartiology is. Sin is harmful. Sin is harmful. But hemartiology is the doctrine of sin. <clears throat> and um, I'm going to give you several references that you can look up um, at, at another time if you'd like and to see what the Word of God has to say. These are what we might call some key scriptures concerning this important subject. And one of them is Psalm 51 and verse number four. And we read, <clears throat> against thee, <clears throat> thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. That's Psalm 51 and verse number four. Um, Isaiah 53, 6, Isaiah 53, 6 is another key scripture. All we have gone, excuse me, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. That word iniquity is a, is a word for sin. Of course, Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Another key scripture is James 1, verses 14 and 15. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Uh, then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. 1 John 1, 9 tells us if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And in 1 John 3, 4, another key reference, whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. Now, in just a moment, we're going to, we're going to see a definition for sin and how all of these words that we see from these references uh, really modify or they make clear as to what sin is. Um, you have words like sinned, um, wicked way, um, iniquity, um, um, transgression, okay? These are all words that are key words and understanding what this biblical doctrine is. So, so hemartiology is the doctrine of sin. I'm gonna read these two quotes to you. Okay, first of all, here's this first quote. There is a difference between what is biblical and what is perceived to be moral. Okay? We must define what is right and what is wrong by the unchanging truth of God's word. Remember that the Bible is our final authority. Okay? 
in our Baptist distinctives, in our Baptist distinctives, okay, the, the very first one is the letter B, which is biblical authority, uh, meaning that the word of God is our final authority for faith and practice. Uh, what we believe, what we believe comes from the word of God. And, and one thing is, and I think is, is very true, what we believe determines our behavior, okay? So we can approach this hamartiology, this doctrine of sin, and say, well, you know, it's not really that bad, okay? Or we can see it for what the Word of God says, and God condemns sin, and he hates sin, and Christ died for sin. So, so what's right and wrong, what's right and wrong is, is always defined by the unchanging truth of God's word. Sin is sin, okay? Sin is sin. Sin is not, sin is not having a weak moment. Sin is not anything to laugh at. Um, sin, sin is a very important issue. And so we, we define it according to what the unchanging word of God has to say. And here's a second, um, here's a second quote, okay? The more we know God, the clearer we can see what God is unlike, okay? Sure, the more we know God, we see him for who he is, but we also see clearer uh, what is unlike God. In other words, the more we know God, we can see just how exceedingly sinful sin truly is. And um, I, I want us to begin, I want us to begin here in Isaiah chapter number six, keeping this thought in mind. <clears throat> the more we know God, the clearer we can see what is unlike God. Sin is unlike God. Isaiah chapter number six, <clears throat> Isaiah had, had, had received a vision of the holiness of almighty God. And it just, it just, it did him in. It was an amazing thing that he saw, okay? And just look in chapter number six of Isaiah, beginning here in verse number one. We read, in the year that King Isaiah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face and with twain he covered his feet and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, <clears throat> because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken from the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. And Isaiah has this vision of the exalted and glorified Lord. He sees the Lord in this incredible position. He sees him high, he sees him holy, he sees him exalted, and he sees him lifted up. And he sees the great glory of God here. And, and as he sees him, he recognizes, he recognizes exactly what he is. He is undone. He recognizes his, his own sinfulness, his own sinfulness. And so he saw what the Lord is like. He is holy, he is exalted, he is high, he is lifted up, and he saw what he is unlike. In other words, he saw that he is unlike anything that there is. 
And, you know, all men, according to the Bible, are sinners. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. And so the more we know God, the more we know God, the clearer we can see what is unlike God. For example, um, God is light. God is light. And what does the light do? Well, light exposes darkness, right? So you see the picture there. Okay, so we see the picture here. So hemartiology is the doctrine of sin. Now, I've given you some things here, okay? Number one here, let's, let's look at the entrance, the entrance of sin, okay? So letter A, sin was first found in the heart of Satan. It was first found in the heart of Satan. Now, for time's sake, we're not going to take a look at Ezekiel 28. And um, you can see about Satan's characteristics in there. He was beautiful. He was absolutely brilliant. He was, he was, a, he was bright. And, um, and Ezekiel writes uh, uh, about Tyrus, an earthly king, but he's also referring to the evil personage behind him in Ezekiel chapter 28, which of course describes Satan, his, his characteristics. He was beautiful. He was brilliant. He was, he was bright when God, God originally made him. Okay, God made him, and of course, he was Lucifer. He is the anointing cherub that covereth. But I want us, since we are in Isaiah, to turn to Isaiah chapter number 14. Isaiah chapter number 14. Now, when, when God made him, okay, God made him this beautiful, brilliant, and bright being. And uh, that's, that's Lucifer. He had really an incredible position, an exalted position in heaven, okay? The only one greater than he was Almighty God himself. And what Satan had in this position, uh, he wanted more, okay? He actually wanted God's throne for himself. In Isaiah chapter 14, beginning in verse number 12, Isaiah describes for us the fall of Satan, Okay, the fall of Satan. And we read beginning in verse 12. How art thou fallen from where? Heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How art thou cut down to the ground and didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God, I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. So you see how, how sin, how sin was first found in the heart of Satan. Satan said in his heart, I will five times. I will. He said, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne. I will sit also upon the throne. I will ascend above the heights. I will be like the most high. So when we, when we look at sin, we look at sin, the entrance of sin, it was first found in the heart of Satan. God made Lucifer, okay, he made Lucifer, the anointed cherub that covereth. He was brilliant. He radiated with light. He, he was a bright being, okay? He, he was brilliant. He was given wisdom, wisdom that was given to him from God. He was brilliant. He was, he was a beautiful being. He, he was bright, but he, but he felt there was pride in his heart because he wanted to ascend. He really wanted the throne of God for himself. So the entrance of sin was first found, right, in the heart of Satan. And then let's notice this. Sin entered into the human race through Adam, okay? 
So sin entered the human race through the first man, Adam. And let's look in James chapter number one, and let's note the reason that man sinned. James chapter number one, and let's note the reason why he sinned. James chapter number one. All right, let's look at verses 14 and 15. Actually, we'll back up to verse number 13. In verse 13, the Bible says, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Do not err, my beloved brethren. So there's, there's two reasons why man sinned. Okay? Now, first of all, there is a temptation from without. A temptation from without. We see that in verse number 14. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Enticement. There's an enticement there. The word enticement, it comes with the idea to be lured by a bait. Like when one is fishing. When one is fishing. A fisherman will put a nice hunk of bait okay, on the end of his hook. And he can't see, the fish cannot see, the fish cannot see the hook if it's in that bait. And that, and that bait is very attractive to that unsuspecting fish. And the fish comes and he sees it, and he senses it, he smells it, and then boom, he bites into it. And by the time he's done that, it's too late because he's now hooked. Well, you think about the temptation in the garden. And how did, how did Satan come and tempted Eve? He, he lured her. He enticed her. Okay? He, he showed her that which was forbidden. And it appealed. It appealed to her. So the reason that man sinned is because there was a temptation from without. Okay? There was a temptation from without. But that temptation from without becomes a decision from within. So there's the temptation that is without that becomes a decision from within. Verse 15, then when lust hath conceived, okay, the temptation is from without, okay, it becomes a decision from within, it bringeth forth sin, and sin when it is finished bringeth forth death. So when desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And that's what happened in the garden. There was a temptation from without to Eve, and then she made a decision from within, and that brought forth death. Okay, that brought forth death. Now, what are some of the results of sin. Well, one thing, one result of sin, sin led to spiritual death. Turn with me to Genesis chapter number two. Genesis chapter number two. You know, Genesis, the book of beginnings, is the foundational book in the Bible, okay? And particularly the first 11 chapters. Because everything that God needs us to know about, about anything and everything is, is right here in these first 11 chapters. The creation is here. The fall of man is here. The first mention of the gospel, chapter 3, verse 15, is here. God's judgment upon sin is here. The ark, the means of escape and salvation is here. The repeopling, repopulating, replenishing the earth is here. The table of the nations is here. 
we, we, we see man's attempts to reach God through a one world humanistic system with um, in chapter number 11 um, with Nimrod and so forth. Everything is right here. And, and I believe that the devil obviously despises, he hates the first 11 chapters of Genesis because they're foundational. And if the foundations be removed, what can the righteous do? So we have one of the results of sin in chapter number two in verse number 17, and that is spiritual death. And <clears throat> we read, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, Thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Well, in the day that Adam and Eve ate of the fruit of, of the tree, they didn't, they didn't die physically, but they died spiritually. They died spiritually. Okay? And spiritual death is the condition that humanity is in apart from the regenerating work of God, the Holy Spirit. All men are dead spiritually. All men are dead spiritually. If you remember when we were um, looking a couple of weeks back um, about uh, the, the, the work of the Holy Spirit, that you know man is more than just a body, and he's more than a soul. He has a soul, but he also has a spirit, his spirit. And in, in one's spirit, that's where we are conscious of God. We're conscious of God in our spirit. And the Apostle Paul puts it like this. And you, Ephesians 2, hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and in sins. And so he's speaking there in Ephesians chapter 2 in those opening verses about one's spiritual death. He said, you hath he quickened which were dead, spiritually dead in trespasses and in sins. The word quicken means to be made alive. And that is the regenerating work of God by his spirit to, to, make, to make a soul, a spirit that was dead, to make it alive, to make it alive in Christ. And so one result of sin is spiritual death. Another one was physical death. Chapter 3, verse 19 says, in the sweat of thy face, shall thou eat bread till thou return unto the ground. For out of it was thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shall thou return. So there is physical death. Why do people die? Why do people die? Well, people die because of sin. That is, that is the underlying factor of death. People die because of sin. Guilt and shame was another result of sin. Chapter 3 and verse number 7 says, and the eyes of them were both opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. You know, um, man attempting to clothe himself before the omniscient eyes of God. When they sinned, their eyes were opened. They saw one another, and they were ashamed. There was guilt there. Uh, another result of sin was broken fellowship with God in verses 8 through 10. Uh, they saw Adam and Eve um, sought to, to hide themselves. Adam sought to hide himself as God came to him. Loss of blessings in chapter 3 in verses 22 through 24. Uh, God drove the man out of the garden. So there's the results of sin. And the results of sin, uh, boy, are just so clearly, clearly seen today. People riot, people murder, people cause mayhem, people bring carnage, destruction. Um, an election um, where not every vote has been counted properly, um, steal and do all these things. And, you know, well, why do they do this? And we, we think that, you know, man can be reformed. He can change his ways. He can't. He can't. Just like a leper cannot change his spots. He does what he does because he is a sinner. He sins because he is a sinner. That's why this word hamartiology ought to be looked at harm. <laughs> because it's harmful. 
So the results, the results of sin. Now, let me give you the definition, the definition of sin. So there's some key words in Scripture. And, um, you know, you, I think you could see these words, sin, evil, transgression, iniquity, wicked, and ungodly. Okay, some key words in Scripture. And so as we study the words of the Bible used for sin, we develop a biblical concept of sin, and that is the key, okay? We need to study the words of the Bible that are used for sin. Not what a person or men have to say, but what does God have to say about it? And as we do that, we develop this biblical concept for it. All right, so the first one, the first one is the word itself, sin, okay? It's the word sin. And oftentimes the word sin means to miss the mark. It means to hit the wrong mark. Um, Romans 3.23 uh, tells us, For all have sinned and come short. We've come short of the glory of God. God himself, God himself is the perfect mark. We've all fallen short. We've all fallen short of his perfection, okay? And we've ended up hitting a wrong mark. Um, sin separates us from God, um, for all have sinned, okay? So sin means to miss the mark intentionally, okay? Or to hit the wrong mark. Um, then there is the word evil, the word evil. And the word evil means to break up or to ruin, um, to cause calamity. Um, let's see here. Let's look in Romans chapter 13 for a moment. Romans chapter 13. Now let's know what the Apostle Paul under inspiration of the Holy Spirit says in uh, Romans chapter number 13. He says for verses three and four, he says, for rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil, okay, to the evil. Rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. In other words, to those who would cause calamity. Will thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same, for he is a minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, in other words, that which causes ruin or causes calamity, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil evil, the minister of God. A little while back in church, I had preached a message on the minister of God in blue. And I thought it was a timely manner to discuss some things, considering what was happening this past summer with all of these riots going on in some of the cities um, uh, across America. Some of that stuff is still continuing on. And, and the evil, the evil personifies what people do when they, when they burn down stores, when they loot, when they take lives, okay, they are, they are causing calamity. They are causing calamity. And ultimately, if justice is not served in this life, it certainly will, it certainly will at the, certainly will be at the great white throne, okay? So um, evil is, a, is another word used in scripture to define sin. And then we have the word transgression, transgression. Can you, hope you can see that word transgression here. And the word transgression means to rebel against God, okay? It means a step beyond a fixed limit. It's a willful act of violating the law. Um, Hebrews chapter 9, Hebrews chapter 9, um, and let's see, verse number 15. Hebrews chapter 9 and <clears throat> verse number 
No, that would not be the passage. Uh, anyway, Hebrews doesn't write about that here, uh, but Paul does in Galatians in chapter 3. Well, anyway, what it means is this. It means to be a rebel. Okay, it means to go beyond the law. Um, Galatians, that's it, Galatians chapter 3, Galatians chapter 3, verse number 19. And, and we know the law that God gave is holy and just and good. Okay, and the law was established so that we would not go beyond those boundaries. And uh, it's therefore one's good. Okay, look at verse 19, Galatians 3, verse 19. Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgressions. There's the word. Till the seed should come to the promise was made, and it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. So, so the law was added. It was added, okay? It was added to keep man within specific bounds so that he might not go beyond those bounds and come into danger. But to transgress means to rebel against those bounds that God has established. It violates the law, in other words. And there's another word, the word iniquity. And the word iniquity means to be guilty of breaking God's law. In the New Testament, it means to be lawless or without law. So to be guilty of breaking God's law. Um, I want to make sure I've got my reference right here. But in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verses 8 and 9, say, but we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully. Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men stealers, for liars, for perjured persons, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. So the word iniquity, to be guilty of breaking God's law, it means lawless. Then there is the word wicked, the word wicked. The word wicked means the opposite of what is righteous, the opposite of what is righteous. It's very interesting that the Antichrist is called that wicked one. The Bible says Jesus Christ, the righteous. The Bible calls the Antichrist that wicked one, meaning that he is the total antithesis. He is the total opposite of what is righteous. Then there is the word ungodly, ungodly. And the word ungodly simply means giving no regard to God. One who is godless. Many people live ungodly lives by giving no regard to God. It's a life of vanity, as Solomon puts it, life that is lived under the sun. Here's a key thought in scripture, and we'll close out this section on Hamar theology. One, sin is any lack of conformity to the law of God, whether in act, disposition, or state. And maybe we can write that down somewhere. I'll repeat it a couple of times. There's two thoughts I want to give you and write both of these down. Number one, sin is any lack of conformity to the law of God. Sin is any lack of conformity to the law of God, whether in act, 
disposition, or state. Sin is any lack of conformity to the law of God, whether in act, disposition, or state. It's like this. We sin. That's our act. We are sinners. That is our disposition. We are in sin. That's our state. And here's a second thought. Okay. Sin is that which is contrary to to the holy character of God. Sin is that which is contrary to the holy character of God. Sin is that which is contrary to the holy character of God. Now for the next time, we're going to take a look at both the description and the results of sin. Thank you.